what has worked um i'll say documenting the processes um so initially it was a struggle because i just assumed that the team should understand what i want done um, and this was with trisha biz we barely I'm, I'm in the process of documenting um so i sat down one day i was super frustrated i'm sure i'll find the note somewhere and i sat or i was on a flight to lagos i wrote out all the processes on my one hour flight i came back i handed the book to one of my team members then and i said type them out so this is so i i wrote out steps um so i didn't go the i didn't do the old conventional sop king no i just did a step by step of what you're supposed to do for everything so for a webinar this is what happens from when we announce it till when the replays go out for a coaching clients this is what happens from the inquiry email till they come on board like and i created different documents um, and handed them over um, so that drastically reduced my getting upset why you guys not f um, functioning the way I want it to be. And then the fact that I'm involved in the business also helps because I can see where there are lapses and jump on it. So it's a service business. It's not like I'm manufacturing anything where everybody just knows what they should manufacture, put it in the jar and then send it to the market. Um, the service businesses, especially my kind, is quite tricky because my reputation is what is at stake. Um, and unlike other types of businesses where the owner and the brand can be differentiated, um, I am the brand, I am the owner, I am everything. So I have to double check sometimes to see um, if the processes are being adhered to based on, um, <coughs> based on what we wrote out. Then third thing I involved, I included, um, remun not remuneration, um, rewards and sanctions. Um, and then if you do X, Y, Z, you'd get something added. Um, so yes, so that also helped us sit up. And now there's like, I, I can see the conscious effort to double check um, before it goes out. Um, the business gas station is, is still that experiment child. Um, so I launched it last year um, because I didn't want to be the one to do everything. I wanted to just focus on coaching and teaching with Trisha Bees. Um, so I wanted a consulting firm that could handle some um, business challenges that entrepreneurs had. Again, everything I do is serving the micro and small guys and some, some medium entrepreneurs, but not really large guys. Um, so I, when I started it, I put four things. So the idea is, you know when you, how you drive into a gas station and you can get diesel fuel, yeah. um, lubricants, you can change stuff. So it's like you drive in here and you get a couple of services to um, fuel your business growth. So I was offering four services then, strategy, um, team building, so either training your team or doing team bonding sessions. Um, retail distributions because most entrepreneurs have products and don't know how to get it into stores and nobody was offering them that service. Um, so yes, we, I put that out and I got quite a number of, of clients. I got overwhelmed. So if you go on the Instagram page of TBGS, uh, we haven't posted since October 2018, intentionally. Um, but when people come to Trisha, it's like, Coach, do you know anybody who can? Uh, I can't. Are you joking? My friend, bring my money. <laughs> and somehow we keep getting um, a flow of clients there. But I intentionally haven't done any marketing and I'm still testing with that business because um, I am a, I think it's a curse of being of a creative. I can do so many things. So all my hopping and jumping from company to company, I can do so many things. And that's what I've done with TBJ. So I've done strategy. I've done media, PR launches, press briefings, media conferences, because I did PR for two and a half years of my life. I've done team bonding for even multinationals and medium guys. I've done, just call, name it, in business, I've done it um, with this company. Um, so I've just been testing to see which ones. I've done distribution for like three companies. All the companies I've done distribution for, I've gone to return the products from the stores to them because they are not ready for the credit limits that the stores, stores are not paying you 30 days, 60 days. They are shouting, 
uh, please go and retrieve my products. Um, so I've tested all. Um, by the end of this year, we will know which ones we want to focus on. Then I will properly begin to market it. But for now, I'm just doing as the spirit sends to me. Um, they all have the same focus and they are serving the same kind of um, the same audience um, but the way that we are creating structures in the businesses um, I will be I'm just going to be an expert or a trainer at BLA so even though I found I founded it um, but once we're done with creating all the processes I'm only going to show up on the months I have to teach. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's not going to be taking like a lot of my time. Um, same thing with TBGS. I got a business partner um, who works to deliver on projects there um, so that I have full attention for Trisha Biz because the way they are with Trisha Biz, nobody else can do it. Anybody who pays for Trisha Biz wants Trisha. If there is for coaching or for one-on-one -on -one sessions etc um, so i cannot bring on a staff a partner etc there um, and it's like a value chain so when you come to me for coaching and i look at your business i'm like your business needs this go to the business gas station so somehow it's still in the same um, circle yes but i don't want them to revolve around me so there are other people in the other businesses who run the show um, and I come in when I have to work or attend a meeting or when I have to train for BLA. Our country is not, is not set up to, to support the micro and small enterprises. Um, and it's as a re result of failure on, of the system. So de depends on your business, different things will hit you. If you're in manufacturing, you'll struggle because of power. And the power situation has been like that since I could remember. Um, so you are stuck with providing alternative power for yourself. And then that increases your overhead costs. You throw it into your product, it increases the price. You cannot um, compete with the multinationals who are able to produce on scale, on a large scale. And that can drop the um, unit cost. Now, if you're not there in that kind of business, there are other businesses as well, you will then be stuck with double taxation. You'd have people barge into your office and ask you to pay radio and TV license, like, hello, there's no TV or radio here. Um, they had come here twice. I'm like, you'd have to take me to court because I'm very clear on the fact that I'm not meant to pay any license except I have a TV or radio here. Or the local government will come and ask you for something. Like I already paid the federal government. I already paid Lagos state government. Like, so who are you again? You know, like there's, there's so many things out to frustrate the Nigerian entrepreneur. Um, you, are, you have to either tell yourself, I'm going to do this or I'm not. Um, because it's a, it's a larger issue. It's not just, oh, the, the, and then there's lack of access to funding. Yeah. So for you to scale, you're looking at how you can get funds. Loans are, <laughs> they're not friendly. Um, and then the grants are one in the ocean, and there's hundreds of us that are trying to access the grants. Um, so at the end of the day, you, it's your resolve, like, do I want to do this or not? Because we cannot change, currently we cannot change some of the things that are government focused, etc. I think that you need to budget for all of them so that you don't get frustrated. You need to do proper research to understand what cost will come to you. And when you're doing your pricing model, you need to include those costs because they will come. They may not just come now. Um, so that you're not caught on our ways and you're like, ah, what's this one again? So find out if you can find friends or mentors who have walked the path in your industry or in business as a whole. You know, and find out from them what issues they had to face, what fines they had to pay, 
what levies they had to pay, etc., so that you budget it. You know, so I see some entrepreneurs being smart now. They're using like their personal accounts to do business uh, because they don't want to pay tax. Tax man is coming for you. You know, like now they are tracking people with BVN. They are checking what you post on Instagram. They now, I think they are working hand in hand with the banks. Yes. So they've been freeze. They started freezing account, and then you think that because you have a physical store, they are on Instagram. They are your followers. They are liking. Yes, they are liking you and commenting. <laughs> like so just budget for it because they'll come for their vats they'll come for their in personal income tax they'll come for everything um so just budget it and go and if you're not turning a profit go and declare like there's the opportunity for you to declare and say we did not sell low <laughs> here it is that way you're not fine they're not collecting any money because you came to declare at the said date um so that's what i'll just say like know all these things and if you cannot know it for yourself, get a consultant who will know it for you and they can help you get out of trouble or not even get into it. It's a simple statement. Life is not that serious. So, um, and I know that people learn better when they're at ease and they feel like they're learning from a friend. You know the whole school mentality where you just hated to be there because there was going to be a teacher okay and it continues into adulthood where you just ugh, like not again um because there are suppressed feelings of how you hated primary school and secondary school and even your lecturers in university because it was just an institution that was set out to annoy you and whatnot um so i try and adult education is the hardest of all education ever because now the brain is whether the brain is slower or you have like a million things on your head so i i continually look out for how i can make learning easy easy on the ear easy on the mind um so fusing in dry humor sometimes um and getting them to laugh it and it's also it also serves as a um what you might call it it serves as a an icebreaker without them knowing, so that it juggles them back, they laugh, and then for the next 15 minutes, I know I have their attention before the brain begins to go this way again. So, yeah. How's life growing up? Uh, it was a bit of everything. Um, <clears throat> so my dad was one of those people who lost all his money. <laughs> so in primary school, we're very wealthy, you know, like we're wealthy, wealthy, um, doing very well and everything. And my dad lost all his money and he went from here all the way here. Um, so from secondary school, it was it was a struggle somewhat. Um, I was in Federal Government Girls College um, and because we were there were three of us in Federal Government Schools at that time, it was a struggle to pay the fees at the same time. I know we all resume at, on the same day or a week apart. So from then, I'd already began to think how I could help my dad. Um, so I'll tell him, you know what, pay for others. And, and I'm, I was the youngest of the three of us. Uh, my younger brother was still in primary school. So of the three older ones, I was the youngest. But I'm like, pay for the other two. I would go into school. So I'd study the school system to see that if you were going in with your luggage, you'd be stopped to be searched. So I'll leave my luggage at the gates. My guy must go back. And I'll stroll into school and play. So when the checkers close at 6 p.m., I go with my friends to the gates and bring my bag in. So I bought, I buy my father till meet him. Because when I come back from meet him, they'll search us again and ask for a receipt. Um, so I always used to buy him um, time. And then um, I looked again, what's the issue they have in school that I can use to make money? I realized that Jebu Gari was a thing, a rare thing in Benin. They had a lot of yellow Gari. Um, and I hear it was expensive to buy Jebugari from Airport Road. So I come with a con trailer load of Jebugari and I exchange. So I had empty tins. I give you a cup of Jebugari, give me three spoons of milk. I'll do Milo. So my tin can have needle milk, pig milk, sugar <laughs> milk, like all sorts. Um, but yeah, I did what I had to do to, to get by, get by school. Um, and then after a while, I just became like a terrible child. I think <laughs> my, <laughs> my dad will never admit, uh, but I was just doing everything to be noticed because I think I was frustrated at the point in time. Um, and I was just doing everything wrong. Like anything bad, you find Trisha there. 
right in the middle, ringleader. Um, and that went on all the way into university before I began to have an understanding of, okay, sit up. Um, so yeah, it was the mix here and there. And then I began to work. I worked secondary school on holidays. I was teaching children lessons. Um, I worked in university. I studied English and literature. Um, I was a part-time broadcaster at ITV in Benin. Um, so I used to present on TV and radio um, to go by. So yes, um, I've always had to fend for myself from, um, from young. And because I'm like, I just need to get it going. So I'm one of those children that I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. Um, I wanted to be a pharmacist, but my chemistry teacher was molesting me. So I stopped going to chemistry classes. Um, and I didn't know what else to do because our pharmacy, they said I needed to pass chemistry and physics. So they invited my dad and said I needed to move to commercial class. I didn't even know anything, like what do they do in commercial class? <laughs> so I did a switch SS2 third term, which was like close to writing exams. Um, and then my father's dream of me becoming a lawyer, I was like, yes, you can be a lawyer. So they threw me into law, jammed in the um, Ben did not give me law, he gave me English and literature. I think I'm very grateful. Um, so my dad came back again in my 200 level and took me to write jam. Like you drive from Lagos to Benin. <laughs> I took me to write jam. In that second jam, like for what? My mates will be going to 200 level and I'll be going to, no. So I taught everybody everything and I only shaded maybe English. So of course it was a failure, absolute failure. And I convinced him that, but you know your daughter is brilliant. That is not my result. Uh, you know, jam. So he believed, and that was how I stuck. But all through, I didn't know what to, like, could I be a teacher? Like, I didn't know what I was going to do um, with it. So when everybody had their, like, their lives figured out, I felt like a failure. Like, so what would I do? Um, so in, in camp, when I was done with, with school in camp, I met a friend. I met somebody, we became friends, and she told me about public relations. And she's like, I think that you thrive in PR. I'd never heard about PR. You know, so I went and made inquiries. She, she had, I think she had a brochure for, for me. She had a brochure, and she showed me, she explained what they do and everything. So while I was done with camp, when we're done with camp and we're posted to our primary uh, place of assignment, I went to look for Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, not maybe, I signed up. So I was doing weekend classes there. Um, and that's how I started my career. So I started with PR and I've, I kept moving. So I realized, oh, in the marketing circle, they can do this. Okay, I'll move here. And I kept moving until I went through like what the circle of marketing and advertising So it was at NIPR. I used to go for weekend classes at Maryland to, to take the exam. And somebody I met there, again, a friend, told me about an opening with my first boss ever, Mr. Ken. And she was like, oh, that it was an internship role. He was offering 7,500 naira. I was a big girl copper. I earned 25,000 as a copper. Mine was government allowee. So my dad thought that something was fundamentally wrong with me to go all the way down. Like at least the first job you should get to be like maybe 40K or something. Um, for me, I knew I just wanted to learn because I didn't even know what I was going to do in my, my life. Um, so I just told him that, can you be giving me seven five every month in addition to my salary? Because transport to and fro the office every month was 10K. And then I needed to feed. So I'm like, 4K, okay. I'll be fine. Um, so I, I got the job. I went for the interview. It was like, it's been my hardest interview ever. Because he interviewed me with his wife. They kept asking me like a zillion questions. I'd never done an interview before and all that. My interview to work in broadcasting was to do a recording. So it wasn't like, tell me about yourself. What's your five-year plan? What's five-year plan? Like, I don't even know my now plan. They asked me for a five-year plan. Um, but I got in. And in three months, I think, no, like four months, I was confirmed and I was offered full-time, I think, they now made it 20-something K. Um, but because I applied myself, I became project lead with my 20-something K. 
Um, and then I just kept looking for opportunities. I applied for the next role. Um, <coughs> my broadcasting experience helped me. They wanted somebody who understood media. I got in, so I moved from Yaba to Ikoi. They added 25K, so it was 50K. Um, so I just kept moving. Then the next one was in Lekki. So I kept going further from home. <laughs> and the Lekki role, I applied as a graduate trainee. Um, so when I went for the interview, well, there was like a hundred of us. I went for the interview. It was a PR consulting firm. And chairman said that you're too qualified to be the graduate in, yeah, yeah, okay, overqualified. Um, so we won't be taking you. I felt crushed. Um, so I went back. But apparently the HR kept my CV. So another four months time, a role opened as a senior executive. And she called me. I went for the interview on a Saturday. I got the job and it was 100K. And it just kept going. It just kept going all the way. I was a senior executive there. And then from there, I moved to brand manager. I moved to senior brand manager. I moved to account director. Like I I kept moving all the way. So by the time I, um, I stopped working, I was category marketing manager at GSK.